Have you ever wanted more Nightmare on Elm Street movies? Ones that didn't try that hard? Ones that had a soap opera budget and PG-13 level violence? Well, what if I told you there was a feature-length story that sort of detailed the events of Freddy Krueger's prom night and high school reunion? What if I told you that story featured Robert England in his prime portraying Freddy? What if I told you that it was absolute unfiltered madness? What if I told you I was about to describe it in a YouTube video right now? Hey Skatey Cats, today I'm going to talk about an episode of Freddy's Nightmares, a short-lived anthology horror TV series from the late 80s where Freddy Krueger himself introduced and sometimes featured in spooky stories set within the fictional town of Springwood from A Nightmare on Elm Street. In order to do that, I'll have to talk about another, largely unrelated episode of Freddy's Nightmares for reasons that will become... Well, not, not clear exactly, but hopefully they will convey the information to you accurately. This is a surprisingly convoluted story that takes all kinds of swerves that you might not expect. And that's almost entirely because it's not well written at all. I don't want to be too hard on this cash-in TV show from 30 years ago, but boy, this thing's a friggin' mess. I don't really feel like anyone involved cared all that much, but its existence and the implications it has for the greater lore of the franchise are endlessly fascinating to me. Also, no matter how boring and cheap it is, it's just fun to watch how they try to pull this off with the constraints of cable TV in the 80s. Don't worry, though, both of the episodes I'm going to discuss are incredibly horny, so you're, you're not going to get bored. Okay, so this story about Freddy's prom night and high school reunion opens like this. What is this? Why is it happening to me? What does it mean? It's the fantasy of has-been photographer Stoney Adler, a once highly in-demand artist now reduced to the miserable grind of taking family portraits, a fate the show portrays as worse than death, even though the family is really nice and polite and it seems like a steady paycheck every year. Stoney Adler gets a call from Tori Bodner. God, the names are incredible. The editor in a new magazine called Kink. Now it's not, not a pornographic magazine, it's just a sleazy hipster magazine. But the title leads to this exchange. Ever hear a kink? Well, I was open to it. <laughs> the magazine. Oh, Stoney, come on. You were real fast with that response. Get it, girl. Tori offers Stoney another chance at the big time. All she's got to do is take some racky photos. Do you think that I meant to say racy? I did not. Your forte was cutting edge, borderline wild, racky. Racky? Yeah, out there, really reaching. Right. Racky. Racky is a word people use. So, okay, you've got to take a photo, the rackiest photo you can, that's going to get people talking. Something that'll sell some magazines. An image so striking, so unforgettable, that it'll reignite people's demand for your work. Something that really grabs their attention and won't let go. Stoney chooses a model in an off-the-rack sexy Halloween costume. We're then introduced to her new assistant, hired by Tori, Oliver. Oliver has three character quirks which define him. He's new age. I used to do crystals, but uh, horrors are a real kick. Not totally on top of them yet. Alert me when you are. He's horny. I don't see what this has to do with Halloween. I'm gonna pop right out of this. That's cool. Trick and treat. Get bent, buddy. And he works for people. Grab that pile of props and drag them over in front of the uh, big gray thing. Yeah, the ones labeled Ripper. <laughs> like Jack the Ripper? One and the same. Whoa, hey, racket. Anyway, the witch was out late partying, so she falls asleep, and you know what that means. Frederick Krueger shows up and makes her dance with him, like he always does. And so she's spooked, and she runs out the door, so the photos are no good. Okay, round two, we'll get another model to be a sexy vampire, and we'll have her hold a big prop wooden stake up in the air. Do you want erotic, weird, sick, funny, goofy? I'm up for it. Uh, how about, uh, racky? But right before that, why don't we go ahead and let her take a little nap for some reason. And whoops, Freddy comes along and bestabinates her. He then makes a business deal with Stoney. He'll help her get real good photos and all she's got to do is make sure her models fall asleep so he can get them. Now I understand what Stoney gets out of that arrangement, but what does Freddy get out of it? The, the models would sleep anyway, everyone sleeps. So Stoney goes along with it and she sets up this lady to get mummy on by Freddy, who then goes back on the deal and stabs out Stoney's eyes. The lesson here? Be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. Get it good. 
But I don't know if she did wish for that. Like, she wished to be a famous photographer again. I don't really feel like this is this is her doing at all. But forget all of that, because we're moving on to story number two this episode. Mrs. Johnson is reading Kink Magazine, and there's a knock at the door, and she hides it underneath the sofa. So is it a pornographic magazine? It's this guy in a ghost costume, but it's the day before Halloween. What gives? Anyway, the ghost shoots her, and then goes upstairs and shoots her daughter, too. Three FBI agents show up, and you know they're FBI agents because they have the word FBI written on their briefcases. I don't think they have names, but I'm not going to look them up either way which should give you some impression of how important this following segment is going to be. One of them is Psychic, and it's a Twin Peaks pastiche, and he discovers that Freddy Krueger has been tricking people in the house by making them think they're looking at him when actually it's someone else, someone that's not Freddy. So they try to kill Freddy, but the person they end up killing is a different person than Freddy. So the guy in the ghost costume was actually Mr. Johnson. He killed his wife and kid because because he thinks they're a couple of Freddies, and then Freddy kills him. So Freddy shouldn't be able to do that. Like, this isn't happening when people are asleep. He's just making random awake people hallucinate. That's not his thing. But also, why does Mr. Johnson show up dressed as a ghost at his own house? They say it's to get the drop on Freddy, but like, how would that help? Like, Freddy's gonna see the guy in a ghost costume and just stand down like, ah, nothing to see here. This is just a ghost. So Freddy kills the FBI agents, and then more show up later, the end, none of this is relevant. Okay, forget all of that, because now we move on to the episode I want to talk about, but still not the story I want to talk about, because the first part of the episode is about this lady, Maura Ruline, who's pretending to be a psychic as a grift. She claims she can channel the first mate of the Titanic, and, well, just get a load of this performance. Oh my god! Look! Get ahead! A huge iceberg! Oh! Engines full stop! But one audience member is a little too sophisticated for that kind of trickery, and he catches on. We should have seen it coming! Don't stop. Wasn't anyone watching the sonar? Fraud! What? Sonar wasn't invented when the Titanic sailed! Oh, that's what tipped you off, huh? Because before that, this crowd was convinced by this display? <laughs> Sona wasn't invented when the Titanic sailed! <laughs> <laughs> So Oliver walks back into the story somehow. Remember Oliver? Remember him? He heard the psychic lady needed an assistant from somewhere and is here to do that. And she's okay. She's she's like, okay, I'll hire you. You seem like a good, good guy to hire. And you'd think they'd make some like hay over the fact that he is also like a new agey type. Doesn't seem related. And he doesn't seem put off by the fact that she's like complete fraud. You believe in channeling? I'll believe anything if you pay me enough. $10 an hour enough? Racky, when do I start? Stop it. Stop trying to make Racky happen. She explains that while the channeling is all fake, the trance she enters into to do it is real because it helps her deal with stage fright, you see. So she enters into a trance and then fakes being a psychic within that trance. You get it. And I guess being in a trance is sort of like being asleep because wouldn't you know it, she gets possessed by Freddy. And boy, does this actress make a meal out of this. Speak to us. Don't mind if I do, babe! Uh, Who's there? <laughs> it ain't Mickey Mouse! So could Freddy just do that? Could he just take over your body? Because that was the entire point of Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. It seems to be very difficult for him, but he just does it no problem this time. I'm beginning to think they didn't really think this through! She goes to her hotel room to sleep it off. Oliver goes around to the psychic convention where they're performing and he finds the model who played the witch for Stoney Adler. Remember that? Remember when that happened? Remember when the story was about that? She's impressed when she finds out that he works for Mara in a convo with the professional skeptic hell-bent on ruining Mara's career. Both the skeptic, Harry Lee, and the model immediately go to Mara's room where she kills them both. You're a real head turner, babe. <laughs> Please take special note of Harry's incredible wig. Also, why is he going to her hotel room? What is he hoping to accomplish with that? His whole thing is that he's trying to catch her up being a fraud. She's not going to do psychic stuff in her bedroom. So Oliver and Mara's friend, who is another fake psychic, go to help out. The fake psychic guy, for some reason, knows how to do a real exorcism and... Um, we're not priests. We don't have to be. There's only one thing that can motivate her out of this trance, and it sure ain't religion. The power of money compels you. The power of money compels you. The power of money compels you. 
real wet fart of a joke there. Ooh, they spend so long doing this and it is not funny. Freddy kills Mara by plopping this pyramid trophy under her dome piece and then jumps into her friend's body, downgrade of the fucking century, stabs himself in the tummy and kills over dead. Oliver runs out of the room saying the room has bad vibes. Anyway, forget all of that. Forget everything I've said up until now. Sometime later in the same hotel room, these two, Denise and Larry, have hooked up while waiting for their 20th high school reunion. They get room service and Oliver is the bellhop and he tries to warn Larry that the room has bad vibes, but Larry doesn't listen and the food they ordered, it's a rat. Ah, ah, ah. Denise wakes up because it's all a bad dream. How did they know who the bellhop was at the hotel? How did the dream Oliver accurately convey this information to them? <laughs> Used to be kids just dropped out. Now they dropped in. <laughs> the next morning, Larry has a phone call with his agent where it's established he's a hotshot movie writer working on his next script. And then he pranks Denise with a rubber rat for some reason. He already had the rubber rat. The script makes it clear that he already had it. I couldn't resist. I bought it for my cat at the airport. <laughs> So he was just waiting to do this. Why write that in? Denise volunteers to help set up for the reunion where she meets her old friend Cindy and also Howard Nahampkin, a little Dorcas who is Freddie's best pal in high school. They make a big point to always say Howard Nahampkin. They never just call him Howard. It's always Howard Nahampkin. I assume it's some kind of play on words or, or an anagram of something, but I, I couldn't figure out what it was. Also present, the Johnsons. Wait, hold on, I'm confused. They died. They died like right after the thing with Stoney Adler. How is it? I mean, they're the same character. They even mentioned their daughter. It's like, why did you include that detail? Did you not remember that the main thing these characters did was die? Speaking of dying, turns out most of the class of 1970 is already mysteriously dead. That's when Denise is informed about the legend of Freddy Krueger. Gee, whatever happened to Freddy Krueger? Well, if you want to hear about Freddy Krueger, you'd better have a seat. She goes back to see Larry and has a stiff drink and drops this little nugget. Content warning, uh, in this video of all videos, I'm about to discuss childhood sexual assault, so skip to the time code below to avoid that. Pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Thanks, Freddy's Nightmares, thanks for that, thank you. Do you remember a boy named Freddy Krueger? Vaguely. He molested and murdered over a dozen small children. So. This is one of the most hotly debated topics in the Nightmare on Elm Street fandom. Was Freddy Krueger a child killer or a child killer and sexual predator? I've always thought that the answer should be just a killer, because these movies, and absolutely this show, are far too goofy tonally to withstand subject matter like that. But for the record, here we have it, in canon confirmation, the matter is settled forever. Boy, that's gross. Denise is worried because she stood up Freddy at prom as a prank on Freddy. So she's worried about the local legend about this guy who kills people in your dreams. What does she do? She takes a nap. Freddy shows up and he has a genuinely good kill. Like it's, it genuinely seems like right out of a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. He's trying to pin a corsage on Denise, only to pretend to get frustrated and pull out a giant pin and bestabinate her. Good stuff, I like that. Meanwhile, Larry and Howard are striking up a little friendship. Howard is a big fan of Larry's movies and wants to be a screenwriter himself. They hear a scream, find Denise dead, and Larry, being the complete asshole he is, immediately decides this will be a great script for a Hollywood feature film. He's writing so long, he's late for the reunion. But then, oh no, Freddy appears and kills everybody! Ah! Ah! Psych, it was a dream. But also double psych, it's still a dream. Here comes Freddy. He gets in a genuinely good one-liner. I mean, you gotta have heart to write the Freddy Krueger story. And fella, that's something you just ain't got. And then he, he rips Larry's heart out. Love it. Good stuff. Howard shows up to check on Larry alongside Oliver, who lets him into the room for a small bribe, and they find Larry dead. Howard steals Larry's screenplay and claims it as his own, and now the movie Nightmare on Elm Street exists within the Nightmare on Elm Street universe. Except it's written by Howard and Hampkin instead of Wes Craven. Again, I assume this is some kind of play on words joke. I cannot figure it out. My life story on the silver screen. Uh oh, if my friends could see me now. But of course, they're, uh, they're all dead. <laughs> 
Now tell me, is that what you thought would happen? Did you think that this story would develop along these lines? When I first told you it was about an aging photographer trying to relive her glory days, did you predict that it would end here? See, that's what I love about this show. It's just bonkers. The scripts are paper thin excuses for whatever nonsense they could think of, or more accurately, whatever nonsense they could settle for when they factored in budget limitations. It's so delightfully slapdash. The acting is so wonderfully hammy. Shut up, bitch. He can't hear you. I beg your pardon? Uh, nothing. Just talking to myself. <laughs> the jokes are so powerfully not funny even a little bit. Too much negative energy. Negative energy. Uh, I've never been negative a day in my life. I could watch this show forever. I will return to this well. You cannot stop me, this is my channel. But on that note, thank you so much for your support on the last couple of videos. Outlining my whole situation was a pretty emotional process for me and I'm overwhelmed with the outpouring of love and support I've received over the past few weeks. I truly did agonize over the decision to make a Patreon for Scaredy Cats and I'm blown away and truly touched by the generosity you've all shown me. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. In particular, I'd like to thank Devin Kaler, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Eleanor Harvey, and Danwich Games. And I'd like to thank some stars of the channel, including Lance Tintine, Sirius Bengal, Pupbug, Rowan Everly, Kato Moore, Carpad, Josh Moniz, Trevor Collins, Hyla Tracy, Louisa Priesto, Comrade Rose X, and Jesse. You guys, gals, and non-binary pals are truly the stars of the channel. Just like I, Bobby Duke, am also. Hey Bobby, what have you been up to lately? I haven't seen you around in a while. Oh, I had this whole wacky adventure where I accidentally invited two guys to dates at the same restaurant at the same time. Oh, that sounds like a great setup for a classic farce. What, what did you do? Well, I was open and honest with both of them. I explained the situation and rescheduled. Bobby Duke, don't play games, Mildo. 